of our workshop and we move from the local dimension from the south of uh, Mediterranean to a temporary dimension we are going to deal with questions concerning the interwar period. The interwar period is a period uh, that has been marked by high contradictions. The devastation of Europe after the big war was succeeded by a decade of economic prosperity, of social and cultural development. It was a period that ended with the Great Depression and its disastrous development. At the political level, fire empires collapsed, new countries were formed, boundaries were redrawn, and last but not least, the socialist revolution in the Russian Empire challenged the established socioeconomic model. The peoples who had paid the heavy tax of blood during the World War entered into the front of the political scene. Women's suffrage has been enacted in many countries and the democratic characteristics of the regimes have been reinforced. At the constitutional level, main reforms tended to support representative democracy and to enrich it with social rights and goals. The Constitution of Weimar and the Soviet Constitution are examples of the two different approaches concerning the democratic organization of the power. However, the democratic spring of the 20s has been followed by the autumn of the Great Depression and the winter of the race of fascism and Nazism in Europe. Democracy seemed unable to face the tragic socioeconomic problems and the struggle between these who militated for a real democratic and social regime and these who deposited the power in the heads of their Führer has been solved by, this, by the establishment of totalitarianism. Were the constitution enabled to stop the, the totalitarian di diversion? Can a constitution be itself modulate the political progress? These are questions that can be answered by the reference in this so rich and in the same time dark period. And uh, we try to deal with them, um, giving the floor to good colleagues and friends. And first of all, it will be Alexandros Kesopoulos, professor of constitutional law and this, uh, uh, political institutions in the University of Crete. Alexandros uh, will talk to us about the agrarian reform in the Balkans. Uh, and um, we're ready to enjoy uh, the speech. Alexander. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kamchil. Thank you very much, Higienia. And uh, I would like to thank also the Popcorn uh, Project for the invitation. Um, the, my subject is the land uh, redistribution uh, as a limit to the liberal constitutionalism. And I focus on the case uh, of Romania and Bulgaria in the interwar period. In the aftermath of the First World War, most European societies were not only from warfare, but also from the deterioration of the standard of living of both the middle and working classes. A wave of radicalism spread across the old continent, demanding social justice and democratic reforms. Radical demands took various forms determined by the developmental trajectories of its national and reg regional social formation. As regards to countries of the Balkan Peninsula, Bulgaria and Romania, the vast majority of their population were peasants who could hardly cover their basic needs. That uh, land redistribution held the central place in their agenda of political demands. 
Since the constitutions of both countries were liberal and democratic, the sovereign people had the competence to participate in the elections uh, so as to decide which political program should be implemented. Nevertheless, the electoral outcome in both cases, namely the victories of the Bulgarian and Romanian agrarian parties in 1919, was to be sooner or later annulled by the powerful political and economic elites, which were in no way disposed uh, to permit the expropriation of their landed estates. In the context of this sociopolitical struggle, a wide gap occurred between the constitution as a legal text and the constitutional reality. In order to analyze how the political institutions functioned during the interwar period, one has to focus primarily on the political role of the executive branch. The kings of Bulgaria and Romania, in collaboration with the governments, which actually depended upon the crown's confidence, were the state organs that did not hesitate to circumvent in, in numerous occasions the will of the people in order to keep the populist agrarian parties away from power. In other words, they were determined to exercise their competences, not according to the rule of law, but according to the interests of the ruling classes, especially the powerful landowners. The imposition of, of such an arbitrary strategy brought about the constant violation of basic principles of the constitution. For example, most of the elections for the legislature during the interwar years had been anything except free and fair. Many governments were appointed by the crown without being backed by parliamentary majority. And furthermore, in both countries, the communist parties were outlawed. The study of the interwar history of the Balkans is interesting in a twofold manner. On the one hand, the facts themselves are so brutal that they make evident that the main cause of the political and constitutional crisis has to be traced in the socio-economic field. On the other hand, the similarities between the Bulgarian and the Romanian case lead to the conclusion that the normativity of the constitution fades when the bourgeois state decides uh, to protect the property rights of the ruling classes. Let us start our examination with the Bulgarian case. The constitution of Tarnovo, which was promulgated in 1879, has been one of the most progressive constitutions of the 19th century, drawing its inspiration from the ideas of the Enlightenment. It's worth mentioning that it, is, that it established the universal male suffrage and the unicameral legislature, as the Bulgarian Constituent Assembly had decided to adopt the paradigm of the Greek Constitution of 1864. Nevertheless, the constant violation of its provisions during the first decades of its implementation, combined with the defeats of Bulgaria, both in the Balkan Wars and the First World War, heavily undermined the legitimacy of both the crown and the liberal political parties in popular perception. The person responsible for the loss of a significant part of the Bulgarian territory, King Ferdinand, was forced to abdicate in September 1918, and he was succeeded by his son, Boris III. In the context of such a political crisis, the left-wing uh, radical parties, namely the agrarian and the communist, enhanced rapidly their force for two main reasons. Apart, for, apart from being perceived as the party formations representing the true social interests of the peasants and the workers, their popular support was also augmented because of their anti-war stance. In the election that took place in August 1919, the agrarian, the agrarian Union of Alexander Stambuliski gathered 27% of the vote. The communists, while the combined vote of the liberal parties, which had dominated the political scene for many decades, did not exceed percent of the ballot. Since the coalition government formed by the agrarian union, the conservatives and the progressive liberals was not viable, Stambuliski uh, and the king agreed that the parliament had to be dissolved. 
In the new election, which was held in March 1920, the agrarian union scored an electoral triumph, gathering no less than 38% of the vote and electing under its banner 110 out of 229 members of parliament. Nevertheless, it should be noted that the agrarian union itself violated the rules of the game since it annulled 13 seats of the opposition in order to form a single party majority, which effectively allowed it to implement its program without having to make consensus. The main political goal of the Sabuliski government was to reduce social inequalities. For this reason, he, did, he decided to legislate a maximum limit of land property, which was defined to 30 hectares. Since no one had the right to exceed that limit, a great part of the property of the, char, of the church and the large, large landowners had been expropriated and distributed to small-scale peasants. Three years later, in the spring of 1923, Stambuliski reckoned that the timing was proper to hold a new election with a view to augmenting the parliamentary majority of his party and subsequently to revise the constitution of Tarnovo. The first one of these goals was indeed achieved as the agrarian union gathered an outstanding percentage of 54% and elected 212 out of 245 members of parliament. At this point, though, the bourgeois bloc of power decided to resort to violence since it seemed to be rather impossible for the liberal parties to return to power by legal means. The coup d'etat, which was organized by bourgeois politicians, businessmen and uh, military officers, took place uh, in 9th of June of 1923 and that the same day, the Liberal was appointed Prime Minister by the King. Uh, it, it, it was interrupted, my connection. Okay. Uh, for a few seconds, uh, I guess, right? Uh, right where you said that uh, uh, he was appointed by the king. Alexander, do you hear us? Uh, yes, now I do. Uh, it, it was interrupted for, for how long? One minute, not more. So we have heard that it was the coup d'etat, and then uh, the king appointed a, a, a liberal government. Alexander, are you here? Yes, yes, he's. I'm so okay. sorry. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, I, I repeat the, the, the last phrases. Uh, I, I was saying uh, that um, since the coalition government formed by, by the agrarian union, the conservatives and the progressive liberals was not... Uh, Stambuliski and the king agreed that the parliament had to be dissolved. In the new election, which was, which was held in March 1920, the agrarian union scored an electoral, an electoral triumph, uh, gathering 38% of the vote. vote and electing under its banner uh, 110 out of 229 members of parliament. Nevertheless, it should be noted that the agrarian union uh, itself violated the rules of the game since it annulled 13 seats of the opposition in order to form a single party majority, which effectively allowed it to implement its program without having to make consensus. The main political goal of the Stambuliski government was to reduce social inequalities. For these reasons, he decided to legislate a maximum limit of land property, which was defined to 30 hectares. Since no one had the right 
tried to exceed that limit, great part of the third uh, landowners had been expropriated and distributed to small-scale peasants. In the spring of 1923, Stambuliski reckoned that the timing was proper to hold a new election with a view to augmenting the parliamentary majority of his party and subsequently to revise the constitution of Tarnovo. The first one of these goals was indeed achieved as the agrarian union gathered an outstanding percentage of 54% and elected 212 out, out of 245 members of parliament. At this point though, the bourgeois bloc of power decided to resort to violence since it seemed to be rather impossible for the liberal parties to return to power by legal means. The coup d'etat, which was organized by bourgeois politicians, businessmen and military officers, took place in 9th of June of 1923, and at the same day, the liberal leader, Alexander Tsankov, was appointed prime minister by the king. Five days later, Alexander Stambuliski was arrested by men of a paramilitary group, and after being tortured, he was murdered in the garden of his house. The aim of the coup d'etat was not the imposition of a dictatorship, but the establishment of a sui generis emergency regime, which, although it had the form of a constitutional republic, it did not function actually according to any of its basic principles. Just to give a few examples, uh, the elections of 1923 and 1927 took place under conditions of terror for the supporters of the agrarian and the other left-wing parties. In the first election, the so-called Democratic Alliance gathered the percentage of 58%, while in the second, the percentage of the same Liberal Party was 44%. As regards the types of violence, it was not exerted only by the repressive mechanism of the state, namely the police and the army, but also by the International Macedonian Revolutionary Organization. IMRO was not uh, a simple nationalist group, but a paramilitary organization which did not hesitate to murder citizens who either expressed democratic ideas or stood up for the improvement of the relations between Bulgaria and Yugoslavia. Another violation of the rule of law concerned the issue of several uh, extraordinary measures aiming at the protection of the state. More specifically, in 1924, uh, the Bulgarian Communist Party had been outlawed, while in 1925, another law was voted which empowered uh, administrative authorities to deprive the freedom of citizens who were considered suspects of disturbing the public order. Taking all this into account, one could argue that the constitution of Tarnovo was, ac was actually deprived of its normative force, and therefore it, it, it evolved into an empty shell for 11 years, till it was finally abolished uh, in 1934 by uh, army colonels. Uh, is my connection stable? More or less. More or less. I, I hope more. Okay. Um, let us now turn to Romania, which by contrast uh, almost doubled its territory after the end of the Great War, since it was, unlike Bulgaria, an ally of the Antant Cordial. As regards the social question, Romania was a country that had to deal with great inequalities, especially in the countryside. Since 72 of the population uh, were peasants and 42 of the agricultural land was concentrated in the hands of large landowners, King Ferdinand felt obliged to announce in 1917 a program of land redistribution. The reason of this political initiative uh, had to do with the fear of the economic elite uh, that the charm of Bolshevism would probably seduce the Romanian peasants unless their standard of living improved substantially. Given that everyone agreed that the reform was necessary, one could wonder what would be at stake after the end of the First World War. Actually, the social struggle was going to focus on the extent of the land redistribution 
And for that reason, the political orientation of the winner of, of the winner of the elections was of vital importance. In the elections of 1919, the National Party of Transylvania and the Agrarian Party won an absolute majority in parliament and formed a coalition government. Nevertheless, the government of Vaida Voivod, which intended to express the hope of the Romanian people for social justice, was not given the chance to implement its radical program of land redistribution since, since it stayed in office for less than five months. Under the pressure of the Romanian economic elite, which was interested in protecting its right to property, King Ferdinand decided to undermine the parliamentary form of government. More specifically, in March 1920, the king dismissed the majority government and appointed General Averescu, who may have had uh, a great personal, but he was leading a political party that did not enjoy a wide popular support. Yet, this kind of problem was going to be settled, given that the people would not be able to express their will genuinely. Since Averescu controlled uh, the state apparatus, he managed to mani manipulate the election and to form a majority government which finally implemented a rather restricted land uh, redistribution. Averescu stayed in office for only one year and a half after the program of land reform was completed and the threat of communism uh, receded. Ion Bracianu, the traditional leader of the Liberal Party, was appointed prime minister by the king. Once again, the favorite politician of the crown and the economic establishment was given the opportunity to manipulate an election and to form a majority government. It's worth mentioning that Bracianu won 260 seats in March 1922, while their respective number less than two years earlier was only uh, 17. That means that in two years, uh, he had 15 times more seats. What kind of conclusions could be drawn uh, through the comparison of these numbers about the Romanian constitutional reality in the interwar period? It's rather obvious that the executive branch made the constant use uh, of two combined methods which violated the constitution and undermined the parliamentary form of government. On the one hand, the king appointed and dismissed governments without taking into consideration the force of the parties in the national assemblies, while on the other, the outcome of the elections was the product of terror and fraud. Nevertheless, Ion Bracianu considered that the use of these methods did not ensure a sufficient control of the political system, so he decided to make an electoral reform following the paradigm of fascist Italy. According to the provisions of the new law, which was voted in 1926, the winner of the election, in case it gathered a percentage of at least 40%, would take as a bonus half of the parliamentary seats, while the other half would be distributed proportionally to all political parties, including the first one. In other words, this extremely majoritarian electoral in combination with the methods of violence and fraud, would actually permit to the favorite of the crown to win the two thirds of the parliamentary seats. One may wonder if the gap between the liberal constitution and the authoritarian constitutional reality uh, in Romania could become wider. The answer is surprising, uh, surprisingly positive. After King Ferdinand died in 1927, he was succeeded by his son, Carol. The new king adopted all the techniques, uh, the techniques used by his father in order to circumvent the popular will and to safeguard the interests of the economic establishment. But he also introduced a new one. Unlike Ferdinand, Carol was not appointing party leaders in the office of prime minister, but he was choosing other eminent party members who were willing to bypass the party hierarchy in order to form their own government. In other words, Carol implemented a, a plan of fragmenting 
both the liberal and the agrarian part. These tactics of divide and rule, which was combined with electoral fraud, undermined further the fundamental principles of the constitution and formed gradually a personal regime of the king. This regime would evolve into a royal dictatorship in 1932, when Carol decided to abolish the constitution of 1923. Concluding, I would say that the analysis of the Bulgarian and the Romanian cases reveals and reminds us the interconnection between the socio-economic and the political institutional field. Especially in periods of crisis, when the social and political conflicts become so acute that they may affect the core of a given economic structure, then the ruling classes do not hesitate to violate the rules of the democratic game. In other words, in periods of crisis, the state has the tendency to be released from the bonds of the rule of law. The study of comparative constitutional history shows that there are many different ways of deviating from legality. The time and the intensity of the deviation depend on many different factors, such as the culture and the constitutional tradition of a state, the international environment, and the balance of political and social power. In the case of the two Balkan countries, all these converging factors brought about a constant and undisguised violation of the liberal constitutions. More specifically, the popular claim for an extensive redistribution of land, the electoral victories of the agrarian parties, the impact of the socialist revolution in Russia, all these factors combined were considered to constitute a direct menace to the holy right to property. And when the core of economic liberalism is threatened, the fundamental principles of political liberalism and democracy prove to be secondary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandre. Uh, the constitution and the constitutional reform as a tool uh, for uh, social democracy, uh, the significance um, of the political parties uh, to support the implementation of constitutional uh, regulations. Uh, you give us food for thought. And now I, will, I would like to pass the floor to our Danish colleagues. Uh, and I hope uh, in the future to our Danish friends, mm -hmm. uh, Anders Homwolle, and Alan Dreyer Hansen, who are, who are going to expose us uh, uh, their thoughts on the social democratic populism uh, in the interwar period in Denmark. Guys, the floor is yours. Yeah, Michael. Michael. Okay. Yeah, hello. So, uh, I want to thank Professor Kamtivu and uh, the Popcorn Project great team uh, that gave me the chance to talk about musical populism in a workshop concerning mainly its political counterpart with the participation of high esteemed legal scholars that some of them are close friends of mine. So the joy is double. Unfortunately, the literature on the concept of musical populism is quite poor. This is due on the one hand to the historical origins of the movement of musical populism, which can be tracked back to the popular front and its connection with the communist party, with the result that the information on it has been obscured by the legacy of the anti-communist historiography. And on the other hand, to the difficulties that the political scientists or historians may face approaching it because they lack technical musical training. Of course, one should distinguish between popular composers and populist composers. A popular composer, no matter if he had a radical political agenda in his works, such as Ludwig van Beethoven, Fidelio, or used popular sources or familiar traditional elements as Charles Ives, cannot be considered as populist. 
A working definition of a populist composer might be one who uses certain elements of folk or vernacular music in his compositions so as to make the concert music, formerly, formerly the guarded sanctum of the elites, accessible to the masses. Musical populism was born out of the experience of the Great Depression and bloomed in the 30s and 40s in a circle of American modernist artists that in the 20s lacked obvious political interest and focused only on the experimentation and avant-gardism. In the early 30s, though, they were awakened and part partly radicalized by the social situation that the economic disaster of 1929 left back, the political movements triggered by the Sacco and Vanzetti execution and the anti-Semitism, anti-immigrant and anti-communist hysteria and the lackluster interest of the public for art. So they turned away from artistic elitism and attempted to reconstruct modernism in order to tie their formal experimentation to a new social, historical and political vision. My presentation will be, will be limited to the artistic, with political reflections, though, work of Aaron Copland from the Depression era through the Second World War. Copland had always questioned the role of the composer in the society. The Depression era created a declining audience for new music and threatened to be the death knell for the modern American music. Copland believed that the composer of the 30s was not just to sit back and wait the audience to return, or even worse, to diminish the value of his music, of his art, in order to address to lower tastes. The composer has to this had to discover and create new audiences. In 1933, wrote in the pages of modern music, his actually presence of his politics, musical politics. The new music in future should no longer be confined to the sphere of the social society. Now it must interest the general public through the usual concert channels and usual interpreters. Their interest in the contemporary music field must be awakened for it no longer contains elements of which they need to be frightened. With the goal to address into an expanded music loving public, Compland introduced a new style, which he termed as simplify as imposed simplicity. This term seems to indicate a newly melodic idiom that incorporate familiar vernacular tunes. In his autobiography, Copland explained the new style, stressing not the technique of this musical idiom, but the functional nature of his composition, underlining mostly the purposes for which he composed and the audiences he had in mind. The concept of imposed simplicity indicated an aesthetic orientation that focused on accessibility and conceived of the musical work as functional as well as high artistic creation. The crisis of the Great Depression intensified his belief that the accessible idiom was not without political implication and that the composer should have a first line position in the cultural front. To understand the quintessence of Copland's populism, populism, which was far from a deliberate turn to an accessible modern style, one must take into account two parameters. Copland's genuine desire to create nationalist modern American music on the pattern of the movement of five in Soviet Union, the Russians. And this was a desire that originated in 20s when he studied in Paris with a great female composer and teacher, Nadia Boulanger. And second, the Copland's attachment to the cultural work of the left-wing social movement known as the Popular Front. Um, <clears throat> Copland's aesthetic ideology was formed mainly through his alignment with radical left-wing politics. The political stance of Copland during the Depression era and the war suited more to progressivism. Progressivism in arts was represented by luminaries such as Brooks, Mumford, Wilson, and Alfred Stinglitz. Re reading magazines that represented the progressive philosophy, such as the Dial, while still standing in Paris, Copland became familiar to its contributors. 
So when he moved back to New York in 1924, he joined a circle of artists and intellectuals that pursued socially responsive form of modernist expressions, and in particular, believed that the creative rush of modernism had to be channeled away from, the ne from an exclusive elite audience and be spent on creating a democratic program of cultural uplift. The truth, the truth is that the historical phenomenon of progressivism is mainly confined to the years before the World War I uh, related to Roosevelt. However, in the Depression era, many left-leaning intellectuals continued to support a convergence on artistic and social progress. Within these circles of progressive artists, there were different ideological tendencies that reached even to the left fringes of the New Deal. During the 30s and the 40s, the progressivism terrain was occupied by the Popular Front, broadly defined as the left-wing social movement. It was an initiative in the mid-30s of the Moscow-based Communist International Comintern that allowed a broad alliance of liberals, progressive and communists to fight against fascism. The Communist Party of the USA ha had adopted, of course, in 1928, the principles of the third period, including no tolerance of leftist reform politics and a hardline revolutionary agenda. Although in 1930, however, in 1934, the official position of Cominter shifted radically and moved to a more inclusive leftism. The Communist Party in line with the new doctrine of the third international called for a united front in response to the growing threat of dentists in Germany. The American Communist Party also adopted a more accommodating stance towards democratic traditions and developed also an interest in folk culture. In the field of arts, party members and fellow travelers founded broad-based organi organizations that succeeded the previous units where leadership would be shared with non-communists. Although Copland was not a member of the Communist Party and chose to describe himself sometimes as a fellow traveler and sometimes as a movement sympathizer, much of his movement, music from the 30s and 40s reflect his in, uh, involvement in communist cultural organization and an alignment with radical left-wing politics as expressed generally by the Popular Front. In his emblematic study, The Cultural Front, uh, Michael Denich distinguishes clearly the cultural history of the 30s and 40s from the history of American communism and helps us to understand Copland's politics. As a left-wing movement related to but independent from the Communist Party and the New Deal, the Front can be considered an encompassing social movement defined more by its vision than its strategies. So Copland's, Copland's politics are a tangle of left-wing ideas about the aesthetization of politics and politicization of aesthetics. Central role to his politics play the Front's rhetoric of labor as applied to the cultural work of artists. The Front encouraged the, the unionization of composers the search of a genuine proletarian music and the effort to use music edu ed education as a means of creating new and more democratic audiences. Copland himself ran the Young Composers Group, an informal association that promoted contemporary music as a reconciliation of the elements of novelty and, tran and transition, and was also a member of the Composers Collective. The collective was an association involved in the reinvasion of the proletarian music. Its members urged the composers to abandon their isolation and address themselves to the broad mass of workers and professional people for whom music is not a luxury, but a thick of immense personal and social concern. Copland's musical production can be categorized in two periods, the proletarian avant-garde era and the musical Pan-Americanism. The proletarian avant-garde era was a brief phase of left-wing culture that promoted modernist aesthetics as a challenge to American industrial capitalism. Copland, like many of his colleagues in this phase, experimented mostly with a mass song. Copland's own proletarian song was Into the Street Made First famous song composed 
for the Communist May Day celebration. He reviewed the 1934 songbook for the new masses and proclaimed it is the first adequate collection of revolutionary songs for American workers. He insisted that the mass song is a powerful weapon to the class struggle, a collective art activity that creates solidarity and inspires action. Music explained had a unique power to influence people. Copland believed that the opinion of the trained musician will not always coincide with that of the masses and that the trained musician will naturally listen to these songs primarily as music, although workers will in the first instance decide how they apply to actualities of their daily struggle. Although Into the Streets was a proletarian song quite diatonical, it was not easy to be perform performed in the picket line. The goal of the popular front composers and Copland was to reconcile left-wing political ideas and musical modernism and not to diminish the modernist idiom for mass consumption. In this context, he rejected German's Gebrauchsmusik or music for use, which actually reflects music, actually the opera, composed in a simplified style, which is especially designed to familiarize non-professional amateurs, performers with musical devices different from those in the classics they knew so well. Uh, main representatives of the Gebraut music was uh, Kurt Weil and Hidemith, Mahagoni, Jägerspiel. Uh, Copland rejected music for use as an art of popularizing music because composing music for amateurs not necessarily result in the creation of good music. Moreover, even composers as Kurt Weil and Hiedemith, as I said before, that introduced the genre of Gebraut music in Germany, continued to reserve their best thoughts for this serious music. Copland himself composed music for use throughout his career. Mass songs, orchestral and band works, suitable for performance by accomplished amateur. Amateurs, sorry. His most known music for use piece is the Second Hurricane, a high school opera. Copland described the Second Hurricane as a music for use with a difference from the German Gebrauchsmusik and the music of Sostakovich in Soviet Union. The composer, according to, to Copland, should compose music in a genre and style that was relevant to his or her culture and time, even if, if in it, it was for amateurs uh, or those not counted among the modern music conoscenti. Above all else, the composer was not to give in to self-indulgence, nor create in isolation solely to please himself. Copland made a good use of avant-garde as an oppositional weapon against the bourgeois conventions, and at the same time directed his, its revolutionary vigor towards social as well as artistic change. And although works as statement for orchestra, the third, the famous third symphony and the piano sonata were composed in a less simplified way than El Salon de Mexico and Appalachian Spring. Although all of them represent Compland's continuing attempt to establish a relationship between the composer and the public. For Copland, music making and music hearing were part of an equal participatory and democratic process. The proletarian avant-garde proved to be short-lived since, by 1934, the official communist position on radical aesthetics, as I said before, had begun to shift. The vague stylistic consensus among American leftist composers should become to change as well, particularly with regard to the use of folk music. In the early 30s, the goal of politicized music was to match revolutionary political content with a simplified but uncompromised modernist mo musical idiom. So um, in the mid decade, there was a growing concern to writing more appealing nativist music invested in the historian imagination of American democracy. Thus the more proletarian style of Into the Streets made first in statements for orchestra fell out of favor almost as soon as they were written. By 19 1935, various forces had aligned to promote American folklore as an emblem of progressive politics. The official Cominter policy and the Communist Party aesthetics, certainly, but also a rising Pan-Americanism, the programs of the New Deal and the 
Popular Front as an encompassing left-wing social movement. All of them encourage artists and intellectuals to draw on the resources of traditional American culture. So by the second half of the 1930s, of the 30s, I'm sorry, folk music was widely considered by leftist composers to be the authentic expression of the American people and the means of relating their concert works to natural culture. So Copland in this environment moved away from the military idiom of the proletarian avant Guard era and approached an accessible folkloric style that was to bring his great success. The first work of this period and the most known work of uh, Aaron Copland was El Salon del Mexico. It might seem surprising that Copland turned to the songs of Mes Mexico before those of the United States, but he had long been aware that another America existed to the South. Copland encouraged the Americas to unite in a never-ending effort to find a musical identity apart from Europe and create a genuine national American music on the borders of the movement of five. Thus, his belonging preoccupation with expressing an American identity in music was not limited to an interest in the United States and can be described as an engagement with musical Pan-Americanism. In particular, El Salon Mexico embraces the class-based politics of the Popular Front and the ideal of ethnic pluralism. A next work of Copland, Tanzón Cubano in 1942, emerged during the war years from the cultural politics of strategic relations between the Americas. These two works speak to a sense of shared destiny in times of crisis, to the vision of pan-ethnic American community united against the continuing hegemony of the whole world and opposed to the destructive legacy of industrial modernism in the new. The desire for a connection between composer and the audience undoubtedly informed Copland's development of a folk-based accessible style appropriately realized first in El Salon, Mexico. Copland's insisted reference to the people, which is quite indifferent that in the first phase was focused on the worker, as the inspiration and audience for his music resonates with Kenneth Burke's 1935 suggestion that the proletarian figure of the worker be subsumed by the more inclusive symbol of the people in the aesthetic philosophy of political, uh, politically aligned artists. As a leading literary theorist and critic, engaged in Marxist criticism during the 30s, Bjork was a part of the popular front social movement, but not the Communist Party. His controversial and influential address before the first American Writers' Congress, Congress in April of 1935 reflected the coming rhetorical and political shift in the co Communist Party from militant proletarianism to a more inclusive cultural form. The symbol I should plead for, Burke explained, as more basic, more of an ideal incentive than that of the worker is that of the people. Björk's desire to shift from the symbol of the worker to the image of the people is often cited as evidence of declining radicalism in the later 30s. And where he has of a turn toward, toward a sentimental liberalism which dissolves the politics of class conflict. The truth is that Björk's rhetoric does not so much discard the worker in favor of the people as they lead these two symbols to infuse populist rhetoric with leftist political content. Articulating a form of radical populist, Björk claimed that nationalism, Americanism, and cultural myths all had the potential to serve the goals of social democracy. Björk's rhetoric was reflected in Kornblatt's famous work, Fanfare of the Common Man, composed in 1942. The Fanfare of the Common Man can be defined as the musical epitome of populist nationalism. The people become a presence in El Salon, Mexico, through the use of traditional songs that Copland found in two published collections, Cancionero Mexicano and El Folklore. Copland certainly felt that they were representative of the people. He described his borrowed tune as both popular Mexican melodies and folk American material. Through the use of Mexican songs, as well as popular dance hall idioms, El Salon, Mexico, musically enact a progressive vision of community, evoking the noise of an urban metropolis 
while using melodic material from traditional rural tunes, thereby linking the proletariat to the people. His imaginative association with and determined invocation of the people, and particularly of an identifiably ethnic working class population, offered a creative solution to the social fragmentation of modernism and the more musical realization of the popular front agenda with its focus on ethnic pluralism and cross-class solidarity. El Salon Mexico reflects the ideology of popular front which expressed sympathy with working class ethnic culture and developed its symbolic allegiance to a pan-ethnic Americanism, radically infl inflected populism. As a symbolic act, the music forges an identification between otherwise distant culture, traditional modern, rural peasant and the urban proletariat, American of all nationalities and ethnicities. Coming to an end, the movement took shape in the early years of the Great Depression and its present may be traced through World War II, during which time popular front culture adopted and took various forms. First, the proletarian avant-garde in the early 30s, a large-scale social movement in the middle of the decade, an aspect of state culture during the height of the Works Progress Administration and an international antifascist alliance during the war. The beginning of the end arrived in the 1940-46 with the onset of the Cold War and the hegemony of anti-communism, though the front ultimately dies only with the natural death of his adherents. Finally, Copland himself moved away gradually from the aesthetics ideology of the popular front, less from fear from the, for the anti-communist hegemony and more depressed by the reception of his music by the critics that implied that his accessible works were somehow less serious than his more abstract composition. In conclusion, he wrote, this indifference that only the severe style is really serious. I don't believe that. What I was trying to fall in the simpler works was only partly a larger audience. They also gave me a chance to try for a homespun musical idiom, similar to what I was trying for in a more hectic fashion in the earlier jazz works. In other words, it was not only musical functionalism that was a question, but also musical language. I like to think that in Billy and the Our City, and somewhat in Likolt, I have touched of myself and others a kind of musical naturalness that we have badly needed, along with great serious works. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aspa. It was fascinating. And now I think uh, uh, we can give uh, 20 minutes mm, to the discussion. Uh, who is interesting? Akritas. Thank you. Uh, thank you for three uh, very, uh, very important and very enjoyable um, uh, presentations. Uh, I would like to make a, a short remark on. Uh, um, Anders and uh, Alan's presentation, which I found very, um, uh, very original. Uh, after listening to, to your presentation, it uh, occurs to me that uh, uh, the history of the Danish social democracy, which obviously I, I, I was not familiar, I'm, I'm not familiar with, uh, is a perfect example uh, that refutes, as you already said, uh, Jan Werner Müller's uh, distinction uh, between popular and populist. I think this is a perfect example that shows um, that popular often or sometimes is populist too. And so there is no analytical um, uh, clarity in the distinction between the two notions. Um, 
if I understand correctly, the, um, the history of social democracy during uh, uh, the interwar period is the history of its transformation from a workers party, that is a class party, to a people's party, that is a party which uh, is uh, inclusive, inclusionary, includes, of course, not everybody, but the many, the masses, and excludes the elites. Um, um, I see a, I see a parallel story story here with what Aspa just uh, presented us. How uh, musical uh, populism uh, uh, attempted to open uh, the artistic uh, production to the masses, music for the masses, and music for the uh, the common man or the common people. So, um, my question is whether you can see, uh, uh, the question uh, is addressed to uh, Anders and uh, Alan, uh, whether you can see European, the tradition of European social democracy and or perhaps more particularly the tradition of the Nordic uh, social democracy as an historical example uh, that is understudied in uh, the populism uh, debate and that could uh, be a European equivalent to the American tradition of the American Populist Party of the late uh, 19th century. I mean, uh, perhaps populism studies have ignored um, a significant uh, political tradition and historical tradition, which could uh, illuminate more all these uh, notional and conceptual, conceptual um, uh, in clarities that uh, the study of populism presently undergoes. Thank you. If you gave me a... Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I couldn't raise sorry, the Sorry, uh, Bobby, uh, sorry, sorry. Bobby, can, can I take the word for just half a minute? I, I said a lot, and perhaps I wasn't. I, uh, I was not clear enough. My question is simply whether um, Alan and Anders um, see what they present is they presented as part of a wider uh, historical tradition of the European social democracy, or more particularly of a Nordic social democracy. Okay, that's that's the question. Thank you. Alan Anders, uh, I think we can give uh, the floor to Babis, who has to ask a question also, huh? and you will answer after. Babi. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, I couldn't raise the virtual hands, so uh, that's why I intervened like that. Uh, congratulations to all uh, in this session also the previous ones, but especially to this. Uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Alexandros, uh, there, is, um, uh, there was a Nikos Muzelis formula about um, uh, early uh, industrialization, uh, industrialization and um, uh, sorry, early parliamentarism and late uh, industrial industrialization uh, in the semi-periphery, uh, comparing uh, Balkans with uh, Latin America. And uh, Stabolinsky um, was presented uh, something like um, the Bulgarian uh, equivalent of uh, 
ε, Περόν, Νορ ε, Βάργα, Αργεντίνα και Βραζίλ. I would like to ask your opinion on uh, on that uh, if he, he can be seen uh, uh, as a populist of this kind. And uh, secondly, I think that uh, in Bulgaria there were also uh, there was also a divided uh, left wing genuine left wing movement uh, between the uh, there were the the socialists of the second international and also the uh, communists uh, who uh, have split it from socialists from 1903 the tesniaki i think was the name uh, the, uh, so what was uh, I think also that uh, uh, the communists were uh, stayed uh, the Bulgarian communists stayed neutral in the coup d'état uh, against uh, Stalinsky, <laughs> and uh, they were criticized uh, to that from the communist international. But if you like, you can say a word on on this. Uh, and also, I would like to ask Aspa. There goes a huge discussion debate on uh, culture in the left wing movement during the 20s and the 30s and there was also a very big discussion on uh, the so called uh, socialist realism and uh, you know all this presentation um, uh, i think that you know it okay not to say much on this so uh, Copland was a part of this current, or he was more uh, uh, close to, for example, Breton and uh, Trotsky and the surrealists uh, who said that we want an independent uh, revolutionary culture, something like that. Thank you very much. Before giving the the speech to Kostas Lachos. I would like Aspa to. I would like ask ask Aspa also if you can see uh, a Gramscian uh, influence in complex view. Costa. Thank you, dear Evgenia. Uh, unfortunately, an unpredicted event uh, didn't permit me to follow the uh, second and the third. Uh, 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 papers, only part of ASPAS, which uh, I regret uh, having uh, missed, as well as our Danish uh, colleagues. But I have uh, uh, two very short questions uh, for uh, Alexandros's, uh, uh, <clears throat> out of Alexandros's uh, uh, paper. First, uh, um, maybe you uh, spoke about it, but I missed it. But uh, I was wondering what was the uh, social and financial uh, status of um, uh, Stabulinsky uh, voters or their families uh, before uh, the war. Uh, uh, was, in other words, words, was the war the only crucial factor uh, which led these uh, uh, these layers of uh, the Bulgarian society uh, to poverty, or was the how were the things in social and uh, financial uh, um, uh, inequality uh, uh, before the war? Uh, this is my first question, and my second question is: uh, I, I think I maybe I might have missed. Maybe you also uh, spoke about that as well. Uh, uh, what about the were there any relations, any communication between the agrarian party and the communist party? Or I, I, I missed this point uh, uh, again in Bulgaria. Thank you. Are there any more questions? No. So I will give the floor in a diverse sense. And I will ask Aspa to be the first to uh, answer the questions and comment uh, the comments. Mm 
micro. Regarding the question of Babis about the socialism, realism aspect of Copeland's politics or her aesthetic, I haven't think of it, it's, it was a good question. I think that she was not so attached to Breton's ideology, but more in social realism, because he, he used this uh, class struggle as, as uh, inspiration, and in the first period of his uh, musical production, and in the second. And in any case, uh, Copland, I didn't say that, I didn't mention it in my speech, was always attached in the Soviet Union composers. He was a great uh, fan of Stravinsky and Shostakovich, uh, especially Shostakovich, who has a political also impact. His music was, has also a political impact. So the answer is that I think that he was more close to the social realism, if I was clear to this. And Gramsci. Mm, I, think, I think I have no answer for this. Uh, maybe yes, uh, in the second part, in the second phase, that he was more close to the popular front, I think that he was close to such an ideology, but Copland, till the end of his life, uh, he rejected that he has an active involvement in politics. He said that my, my uh, purpose was to change aesthetic through politics and not the opposite. That's why I'm not so, uh, so um, I cannot answer to you so directly. That's why I have to think of it. Anders and Alan, Alan and Anders. OK, uh, thank you for the questions. Um, I will start from the relations uh, between the agrarians and the communists, uh, because both uh, Babis and uh, Costas uh, asked me. Um, it was a, a relation of uh, rivalry. Um, uh, Stambuliski, uh, when um, he governed uh, for almost four years, um, he he, he, he was not, a, let's say, a, a liberal politician uh, who, who, who respected the civil and political rights of his opponents. Uh, so um, he often uh, suppressed the opposition, uh, including the communists. Uh, on the other hand, uh, he tried um, to, to participate uh, in the making of another international, a, a green international, uh, which uh, would be uh, co competing to the, to the third international. Now, uh, con concerning the, um, the, 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 the communist new movement in, in, in Bulgaria, the, the part of socialist and communists uh, who were attached to the third international uh, was was much bigger than, than the others. Uh, as I, I mentioned, uh, in the elections of uh, 1919, the, the first elections after the, the Great War, uh, the percentage of the communists uh, was uh, 18%. Um, apart from that, uh, Babis asked me about the coup d'etat. Uh, you're right, Babis, uh, the, the Communist Party um, held a, a neutral, uh, position. Afterwards, the, the Third International uh, criticized uh, the communists for this uh, neutrality, uh, and the Agrarian Union uh, made the kind of self-criticism uh, for not um, helping uh, the, the, the agrarians uh, uh, defend uh, themselves and uh, uh, democracy also. Uh, now, uh, concerning uh, the 19th century, uh, I would say that, um, at my point of view, uh, it was, how to say it, uh, it was very crucial, um, the, the person of the king and uh, the political parties who were attached to the king. 
the political parties uh, in the late 19th century and the first decade of 20th century, uh, the, the two big political parties in Bulgaria was, were the uh, conservatives uh, and the liberals. Both of them uh, were, were close to the crown. So uh, I believe that after uh, the King Ferdinand uh, was delegitimized in the conscience of the people, both because of the poverty and the, uh, the defeat of Bulgaria in the two wars, the Balkan Wars and the, the World War, uh, I believe that the parties who were close to the crown were also delegitimized. So let's say that the whole political system was delegitimized after the, the end of the Second World War. And uh, that's why um, both the agrarians and the communists uh, had the, the opportunity to, to augment their, uh, their, their percentage. So I, I would say that, of course, uh, one reason is the socioeconomic, but uh, I believe that the main reason was rather political and uh, ideological. And I would say also that uh, th these practices that I mentioned, uh, that they took place in, uh, in the interwar period, most of them were known uh, also, uh, especially in Bulgaria, uh, in the late uh, 19th century. So uh, King Ferdinand, the, the, the Bulgarian King Ferdinand, uh, was also uh, a king uh, who, who didn't respect uh, the parliamentary form uh, of government. He, he appointed and dismissed uh, governments uh, without taking uh, into consideration the, the balance of power um, in parliament. Thank you. Thank you all.